welcome to The Inner Core. My name is Paul Rauschenbusch, and I'm the Associate Dean of Religious Life in the Chapel here at Princeton University. This is a show that features conversations about spirituality, morality, uh, the arts, culture, and ethics. And today we have a most impressive guest. I am delighted to welcome to the Inner Core, Professor Paul Muldoon. Welcome to the Inner Core. Thank you very much. I could spend the entire next half an hour talking only about uh, Professor Muldoon's accomplishments, but I am going to limit them to a few, and those will be that he is the chair of the Lewis Center for the Arts. He is a professor of poetry here at Princeton. He is the editor for The New Yorker, the poetry editor, editor for The New Yorker. <laughs> he is a Pulitzer Prize winner, and on and on and on. I will read one, uh, one quote from the Times Literary Supplement that says, he is the most significant English language poet born since the Second World War. Welcome to the Inner Core. Thank you very much indeed. Expectations have been raised very high for this next 30 minutes, and I know you will meet them. They're very high. <laughs> They're very high. <laughs> but welcome. I had the pleasure, I think, of first corresponding with you in the context of writing a sermon for the chapel. And the sermon was entitled, Living with Wisdom. And uh, I wrote to a few people at the university whom, whose opinion I was interested in on what is the meaning of wisdom, what is the importance of wisdom, and you wrote me back a gem of a quote that I did uh, offer to the uh, chapel community, and you said, the wisdom of the artist is the wisdom of humility. Humility before the sense of something beyond him or herself what Wordsworth called wise passiveness. Somebody, could you say a little bit more about that and how this idea of humility before something outside of yourself lends to both the artistic endeavor and the spiritual endeavor in your own life and in, in perhaps the lives of uh, some of our viewers? Well, you know, it's uh, on one hand a very uh, large idea to take in, uh, because particularly I think uh, if one's working in a university. Mm. And I know that often for our students, when I raise this notion with them, it is a little bit difficult in the sense that uh, to have got into Princeton, one almost certainly has had to know something about something, mm. right? So the sense that one actually uh, is pretty adept in knowing is one that tends to predominate in the university. So the sense that I'm interested in, of course, the sense that I'm most interested in inculcating in students and in myself, has to do with unknowing, with the idea that actually one goes into a poem, for example, with absolutely no sense of how one might come out the other end. It's a much scarier idea than saying, I have this, I'm going to do it, I'm going to put it down there, as opposed to being open to what may come and being uncertain whether that will be something good enough. I mean, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty in that. There's a lot of uncertainty in it, but you know, here's, here's the thing. Uh, if it doesn't work out, who's to know? If it does work <laughs> out, something extraordinary may happen. So is this something that you do in your own um, artistic practice with, with when you're sitting down writing a poem? I don't know exactly how you work, but is this something that you will, you will sit there patiently waiting for within, within unknowing? Absolutely. Now generally, generally there's some little hook. There's something that one might be able to hold on to. Um, the nub of something, the you know the, the little flame of something that the, might the, the grain of sand, the, the grain of sand. I mean, there's really not a decent um, metaphor for it. I think. I mean, one of the defining characteristics of a metaphor is that it breaks down almost immediately. <laughs> so, what it might be would be a phrase that uh, has struck one. 
uh, as if for the first time. It might be an image, a comparison, the finding of likeness between unlike things, which is at the heart of metaphor and simile making. So it might be something like that, a tiny little something that one would set down um, like a couple of elements. Generally there are a couple of elements that one might set down as in a petri dish and wait to see if some chemical uh, reaction might, might take place, but not at all sure of what it might be. Now that ignorance that I'm describing, uh, what Wordsworth uh, called wise passiveness, uh, what Keats described as negative capability. Um, the great argument for it is very simple. It's very simple. It's this. If I know what I'm doing, it is almost inevitably the case that you will know also. And the question then is, what's the point? Mm. The point is that we both want to be in a place of revelation where something that neither of us expected to happen will happen. And my job as a writer is to stand in for you as the subsequent reader and insofar as it's possible for me to try to preempt what that I impact or effect might be in the sense of trying to figure out whether or not it will have an impact on you and what it might be. How intentional can you be in this? I'm, you know, you, you, when you, while you were talking, and in my own spiritual uh, tradition, the Christian tradition, I think uh, of, of Mary, who is overcome by the Spirit and says, I can't do this, and it's only her humility, the, the sense of not being able to, that allows her space to be able to uh, do what is you know, proposed to her by the angel Gabriel. How, how how ready can we be for this kind of endeavor? Or is this something that is really, um, really has to come at its own pace? Does, what is the agency of this sense of something beyond ourselves? I mean, is that something that is at work, or is it something that we can only be open to when it's ready? Well, I think we recognize it all the time, and we recognize it all the time, by the way, in the writing. Uh, life. Mm. Even those of us who do not necessarily think of ourselves as having a writing life. Mm. I'm thinking of the writing life one might have if ever we write a letter these days. Let's forget about a letter. Let's stick with an email or a text message. <laughs> um, that sense, I suspect, even in writing a text message that one would have, I must have I've barely done what I, I really yeah, don't, yeah. Don't, have the don't have the technology for that. But I do have a sense, though, that e even in that context, there's a sense that one might look at a text message one wrote six months ago and say, huh, could I possibly have written that? And the question is, as one might mm. read a paper, one wrote six months ago or ten years ago when one was a college student, or a poem one wrote as a teenager and look at it and think, huh, is it possible that I could have written that? And to some extent the answer is uh, yes, of course, uh, but no. It was written through you. You were not in command. And my own belief is when you're not in command, when you are humble before the thing, frankly, only then is anything of any interest going to happen in the arts. Isn't that wonderful? Well, it's, you know what, you described it earlier yourself as been a high, it's a high ambition. But frankly, I'm convinced, insofar as I'm convinced of anything, that if one doesn't live by that, nothing of any interest is going to happen. Mm -hmm. And now you speak of the Christian tradition, and of course it's that sense of what's beyond oneself uh, obtains in that tradition. Uh, in the writing, in, in the spiritual life of the writer, there's the sense, uh, which is the one with which I'm, I suppose, somewhat familiar, there's what's beyond one is, a, is the language itself, mm -hmm. right? Never mind the extent to which the language is connected to a world uh, of which one is attempting to make sense. Mm -hmm. And will, one will only make sense of it through the word. And in that sense, you know, in another intellection, in the beginning was 
and is the word. Mm. Often, uh, when I'm teaching creative writing, um, teaching humility, um, the, a text which I appeal is actually a Zen text. Mm. Um, and it's a text uh, called Zen in the Art of Archery. It's written by a German philosopher, Jürgen Herigel, and Herigel went off to Japan uh, hoping to discover how it was that the Japanese master archers uh, were able, blindfold or in the middle of the night, to hit the bull's eye. How did they do it? Mm. And of course, gradually he discovered that how they did it was um, to completely, in the best sense, and the best Zen tr sense, tradition, to um, put their, their own... the, the, the sense of their, their selves, themselves, mm. to one side. To put that completely out of the, of the picture. And to accept that, to quote him, it shoots, it hits, and only when one has accepted that um, is there any possibility of scoring a bull's eye. Mm. That's is the that, only is, way. Is that, in that comparison, how, is that a way we can judge a, what is a good poem? Certainly. Versus uh, something that seems, you know, somehow recycled or uh, cliche or I mean is that is that it, it's it seems like it happens it's of its uh, it's of itself in a way it is and one indeed may bring that uh, particular system to bear on reading a poem reading and writing a poem well reading and writing a poem are part of the same activity that's right part of the same activity so when I'm writing the poem when the poem is writing itself through me at its best, uh, I'm reading it. It is reading me. Mm. So I am standing in for you, right? If you're the subsequent yes, reader. Yes. And what I'm imagining is how you're going to respond to these words in this order. And when you come to read it, what you're you're putting yourself in my position, as it were, and you are partaking of precisely the same activity as I, the first writer, reader, was. Uh -huh. You are determining what the impact of those words in that order might be. And guess what? You may come to an entirely different conclusion from the person through whom the poem was written. Mm. And one of the things one may immediately detect is whether or not the person through whom, the, well, the person who wrote the poem was indeed writing the poem and thought that she or he was in command, right? Or whether or not they had no idea what they were doing right. and had given themselves over to this process. In some ways, it can be equally surprising, the poem, to the person who's writing it and to the reading it. It can be this, this revelation you use the well, word. Well, absolutely. The great Robert Frost has, has a, a, a line about that. He says, no tears in the writer, no tears in the reader. Isn't that wonderful? So, in fact, one, the two processes are they're part of the same activity. Mm. Mm. They're part of the same activity. But to stress that point, it is absolutely clear when one's reading a poem, if the person who wrote it imagined that she or he knew what she or he was doing. Because there's no surprise. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There is no excitement. Mm -hmm. The question, I, 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 a student I like very much, we had a conversation yesterday about art, and she said, art has a responsibility to be beautiful. Uh, and I'm just wondering what is what how you respond to that? What is the response to uh, you know because because of the pain of the world and because of you know somehow it is irresponsible to put out art that is not beautiful oh i, I I'm afraid I can't I quite accept that mm -hmm. no, I mean the responsibility of art, I think, is to try to be equal to the world 
Mm, that's a wonderful phrasing. To be equal to the world, it's not something that uh, I, I came up with just now. It's an idea that actually is rather splendidly uh, set down by Wallace Stevens. And in fact, he set it down um, initially uh, during a lecture he gave in Princeton, which was subsequently published as a, an essay. It's called The Noble Writer and the Sound of Words. And what he writes about is an extraordinary concept, really, if one gets down to it. It's something called the nobility of the poem. Hmm. And he, rec he, he tries to define what that might be. And he defines it almost in terms of laws of physics. He talks about the nobility of the poem, the force from within it, being equal to the force that might be applied from without. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about a poem being able to sustain itself in the world, to be equal yeah. to the world. Now, you know, there is, I do certainly understand what your, your uh, correspondent, as it were, was saying about beauty. Uh, because, um, you know, I, certainly there is a theory that art, uh, art's main function is to provide succor mm -hmm. and solace in this veil of tears. Right. Right? Uh, now, unfortunately, I, I, I myself just do not fall behind that idea. And I'll tell well, you why. Yeah. I, I think, frankly, that is an appeal by readers, writers, uh, viewers, uh, artists who um, long for something that, frankly, organized religion might at one point have given them and might, might still give them, but which I think, despite the fact that there may be points of contact between the spiritual aspects of making art and clearly uh, religion, I think is a rather unnecessary demand to make of a piece of art. But I would say, I would, I would, I would agree with you, uh, but I would add that for me, good religion and good art, I, I like this idea, are as real as life itself. Absolutely. And, and in fact, in art and in religion, if I don't recognize my pain and mm -hmm. confusion and mm -hmm. suffering, it is no longer, it is not, in my words, salvific because I don't see the compassion, I don't see this, it, it, you know, it, it presents a false sort of uh, a facade of beauty that doesn't go to what is really going on in my soul, which is very conflicted often. Right. And so that, for me, to see art that represents that confliction uh, or conf uh, uh, confusion can be actually the kind of grace of identification that, that allows me to feel um, that I'm not alone in the world, perhaps. Absolutely, uh, but that's a quite different thing, and I, I completely agree with you on that. That's a rather, if not quite different thing, uh, from uh, somehow having, ex expecting of a poem, for example, that it will somehow help one to uh, more than live one's life, which is, by the way, an idea that Wallace Stevens includes in that same essay, but also to save one's soul. Mm. And that, I think, may be a little bit, I mean, that's a metaphor in itself, that may be a little bit much to ask of a work of art. Right. It would be. It would be. You'd really have to have a wise passiveness at that moment to re think that every piece of art had that kind of uh, um, had that kind of duty behind it. Um, I wanted to ask you about uh, the role of your rock and roll band. I. I hope you viewers realize that uh, Professor Muldoon is also a, a rock and roller, and well, uh, and that's uh, you know, well, there's no other way to put it. I've mm. I've, I've I've seen your group uh, in live, and uh, tell me about that. How does that fit in with your um, esteemed chair of the uh, Lewis Center of the Arts and uh, Pulitzer Prize winning uh, uh, poet? Uh, how how does rock and roll fit in? Well, rock and roll you know, certainly for me fits in. I, I, you know, I do hope that it 
the fact that I'm interested in rock and roll isn't perceived by some, as it may well be, to sully the, the, <laughs> <laughs> the ideals of the Lewis Center for the Arts and this oh, kind of high, these high-minded things. But the fact is that there, I'm sure there are a few people, maybe more than a few, in the vicinity who do feel that rock and roll is not exactly, uh, you know, uh, what one said, fit and proper. Mm. Uh, and you know what? They're probably right. There are probably aspects of it that are not entirely fit and proper. Um, however, it's very telling, it seems to me, that at the inauguration of President Barack Obama, the two people who pushed him off, as it were, in his little boat, were Bruce Springsteen and Bono. Mm. And I think one has to ask oneself how we got ourselves into a place where that could possibly be the case. And uh, the fact of the matter is that rock and roll, which was invented within the lifetime of many of us, uh, you know, there's the jury's out as to where exactly it began. But many people would say it began with Chuck Berry. Now, Chuck Berry, one can see, even now, every so often in the vicinity of St. Louis. I saw him a year or two ago playing guitar and doing something, something approximating a duck walk. And, and this, you know, in other words, the people who invented this art form are still uh, practicing it. It, it is uh, an art form, I believe, that uh, while it's not always glorious, uh, it's not always what it might have been, has nonetheless, has nonetheless, um, to use that phrase again, been equal to our predicaments mm. in ways that were actually intelligible to many people that were meaningful to many people, and in you know I I think that for some people you too and uh, Bruce Springsteen actually help them to make sense of their lives. No doubt about and it. And I'm certain, for example, that uh, after 9/11, to think of one recent catast one one catastrophe, that Bruce Springsteen's um, uh, response to that, which is a CD called The Rising, was at least as interesting, uh, if not more interesting, than any of the, you know, the so-called high art responses to it. Right. And, uh, you know, you 2 is, is a band with a, you know, a very, very, very clearly defined and declared uh, spiritual agenda. Right. Oh, absolutely. Um, and social agenda. A uh, social agenda. Um, I, I, we're, we're running out of time. I have one more question. I, I'm sorry to cut you off. You, do, you, uh, do you mind if I no, ask you one more question? I'm absolutely delighted. I, I, um, oftentimes I, I run into you at a, at a coffee shop, a local coffee shop you know, called Small World, and I'll say, you know, I'll, say, I'll say, how are you? And you say something to the effect of, if I can afford a latte in this world, I'm doing well, and and it, I, it, you know, in this world where m perhaps all of us are thinking about how many lattes we can still afford, uh, but I'm wondering, in this world that we are now living in, which is different than it was just four months ago, six months ago, uh, where the economy is seriously impinging what we're, our lives will be about, uh, n not only in places in America but throughout the world. Is poetry a luxury we can no longer afford? No, it's not. Poetry is, uh, again, without overstating the case, without overstating the case, because let's face it, uh, you know, if it's if if it's a choice between poetry and penicillin, mm. you know, penicillin is probably going to be equal to more circumstances. Having said that, having said that. Funnily enough, I was talking to somebody the other day who works for uh, the uh, um, Academy of American Poets, and she was able to tell me that they can divine from the hits on their site uh, why people are coming to that site. And there are two reasons, in 
uh, for the most part, why they're coming. They're coming to find poems that will be relevant, equal to the occasion of a death and or a marriage. And so we know that at these key moments in our lives, I mean there are other key moments, but at these two in particular, we know even if we do not think of a poem from one end of the decade uh, or the millennium now to the other, uh, we know somehow that poetry does have the capacity to help us mm -hmm. make sense of things. Mm -hmm. it's, we're not talking about a cure for cancer, but it does have it within it to may help us make sense of things. And that is because, that is because it is partaking of exactly the same motivation uh, as that urge in the spirit that we usually associate with the spiritual. Uh, it's, it's partaking of precisely the same activity. Paul Muldoon, Thank you so much for being with us here on the Inner Core. Uh, to all of you, our viewers, uh, we are so glad that you were able to join us. And again, we thank uh, Professor Paul Muldoon for his time and wisdom. And I encourage all of you to take a moment today to perhaps uh, sit and let something happen to your own writing or your own spiritual life. Until the next time, my name is Paul Rauschenbusch, and this has been the Inner Core. Thank you.